Welcome to the Master Your Mix podcast, helping engineers, producers, and artists create professional recordings and mixes, even from home. I'm your host, Mike and Davina. Let's get started. Hey, welcome to the Master Mix Podcast. My name is Mike Navina, and thank you so much for being with me today. Today, my guest is Richard Furch. And if you're not familiar with Richard, Richard is a Los Angeles-based mix engineer. He has credits on six Grammy-winning albums out of 23 nominated albums. And he has just done a remarkable amount of work working with artists such as Outkast, Usher, Fountains of Wayne, Prince, Frank Ocean, Jay-Z, Boys to Men, and so many more. And in this conversation, we have a great chat about the concept of making yourself indispensable as an engineer and the importance of the hang and becoming like an extension of the artists that you work with. And these days, it's a little hard to do that, especially when so much work is done virtually. But in this episode, Richard has some really great tips for being able to still hang out with the artists, even if it's remotely, and being able to just build a personal connection with people as you work on their projects. And I think this is really important. We also have another great conversation about the concept of low end, because if you listen to any of Richard's mixes, the mixes sound massive. He has this amazing skill of making the low end sound really, really big, but it doesn't sound overpowering in the mix. And I think when you hear Richard's answer for how he accomplishes this, it's going to blow your mind a little bit because it's actually something that is quite simple and there's no reason that you can't do this in your own mixes. So um, I think you're going to really love that part of the conversation. He's very methodical with the way he approaches his mixes and in the way he answers a lot of these questions here today. So I think you're going to learn a ton. He really breaks down the process in a way that's easy to understand. So with that said, let's just jump right into this interview because I know that you're going to find so much great stuff inside of it. Richard Frisch, thank you so much for being on the Master Mix podcast. How are you today? I'm I'm great. Thanks for having me here. Of course. Great early day, went to the Uber, Bohem- Bohemian Rhapsody was playing, things looked up. That's a good start <laughs> to the day. <laughs> <laughs> for people who might not know your story or your background, can you give us that that background on, you know, how you got into music and ultimately to where you are today with mixing and and uh making amazing records? That sounds like <laughs> like a very easy question to answer. <laughs> no, I I um I am a pianist. I was uh, I started when I was eight. I played forever and ever. I wanted to be a jazz pianist at one point, did, but did like classical trained and classically trained and all that all through my teenage years, and then just then got into Berkeley um, to like pursue that. But I already knew that you know, kind of wanted to be more on the other side of the glass, so to speak, and also realized you know unless you're Herbie Hancock, making a living as a jazz pianist is that's that's a steep hill, so uh, so it was fine. While I was able to, uh, you know, I was not bad or anything like that, but there are certainly better pianists around than me. And so I went, uh, I went on the other side of the glass, like I said, a little bit on the production side, but mostly as an engineer. And uh, in the meantime, I actually also went to the SAE in Berlin. So I basically first went to the SAE, then it was like this is kind of cool. Then went to Berkeley as a dual major well sorry so one major you're an mp and e which is called music production and engineering but you always have to play too because it's a music school right it makes sense this is actually one of the reason one of the way it's different than some of the other schools for for instance engineering um that you always have to be a musician if you're not a musician in berkeley it's not the place for you you know which is which is fine that's not like better or worse that's just it seems like it's kind of an important skill to know though to at least be to have some sort of musical knowledge going into this stuff right yeah, it, it's funny. People say, ask me that from time to time. And um, my answer 20 years ago was like, of course, you have to be a musician. Otherwise, why are you here? Right. <laughs> my answer in 2022 is a little different. It's more like I totally understand that you're interested in making records. I I would uh, appreciate if you look in, into the musical side, but you don't need it necessarily, but it's certainly helpful. I mean, don't like everybody who's a mission, musician will have an extra skill set to use in the studio. Of course, you know, I mean, mm. that's not it, but it's not necessary. That's true. The last thing, and there's is also no judgment at all. I'm just trying to figure out in my head every time I meet a person who's like wants to be an engineer, but is not a musician, for instance, I am always trying to work out this question in my head. So how, how did you get to wanting to be an engineer then? 
Because most engineers that I knew coming up are more like, everybody wants to be a rock star. Come on, let's not lie. A yeah. teenager <laughs> uh, wants to be a rock star. That's why we do music. I mean, there's very, you know, there's very little exceptions to that. Even the people that aren't like art musicians still want to be rock stars. Like the accountants yeah, and whatnot. Everybody wants to be a rock star. Yeah. Come on, just admit it. Let's say it out loud. I, I wanted to be a rock star. I had bands, <laughs> this and that and the other. And then, like I said at the beginning, you at one point you realize the real reality is just a little bit different. And some people leave all the way and become accountants when they should. And it's fine. That's a great job. And some people go like, you know, but the, you know, I have the bug to be in the creative field and do this. So uh, being a musician that kind of fails forward is a very natural way to becoming a producer and a mixer and engineer, et cetera, or, or, you know, other jobs in the industry like AR, a and R, so label owners. So if you don't have that, if you don't come from a point of like, I'm a musician, then it's it's hard for me to understand. So how did you get to be wanting to be an engineer? And that's an open question to everyone. Please, everyone, if that's your dream, actually literally like call me. <laughs> how did you get to that decision? Because I want to know. I literally want to know. I want to share the knowledge. I want to receive the knowledge. Um, but that's where I came from. So anyway, and, um, you know, then I finished at Berkeley, uh, graduated with a degree there. So now I'm basically two degrees in an engineering, one at the SAE and one at Berkeley. And uh, there was an opportunity to go directly from Boston to New York. And I was like, you know, young German dude thought it was pretty cool to live in New York one time in his life. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Got a job at a, a studio called Sound on Sound Studio, which is funny. It's one of the only ones that's still there, not in the same location, et cetera. But the, 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 the owner, Dave Amlin, he uh, packed up the bags at one point and moved to a, a location in New, uh, in New Jersey because the studio before was pretty much exactly in Times Square. Um, but he's still around and I give him super kudos for running a, I mean, multi, multi room professional facility. That's nothing. That's, that's, that's a hard job to like keep that afloat. And then, you know, I'm sure COVID didn't help. But anyway, I went through the ranks there. He was a runner and then an assistant. And that's where actually that exposure came from, came from the exposure to the R&B and hip hop side of things, because New York is full of that. But it was also a cool breeding ground for engineers because, you know, they would do a lot of jingle sessions in the morning uh, or like a Broadway thing or something like that. So basically during the day you would have normal sessions, <laughs> like uh, commercial sessions, uh, like that kind of thing. And then like towards the evening, it would all get booked by uh, R&B re uh, R records and hip hop records. Sorry. A uh, bunch of like stuff for J records at the time, Clive Davis's label, but also Rough Riders. Uh, well, La Face, which is uh, the Usher situation. Uh, all of these would and these are mostly night sessions, as everybody knows these days. You know, those kind of sessions start at six, seven or whatever. People show up at 11 and then you don't get out of there until the next morning. In a, in a way, in a way, I always felt like that was kind of the rock and roll of, you know, the early 2000s, uh, which was also funny because actually the rock records we made at the time were much more uh, tame in that way. They were like, ah, oh, yeah, OK, it's six o'clock. We're going home. <laughs> <laughs> and then the hip hop record would roll in and uh, and whatever you think of a party studio session is definitely happening that time. It was a great time. I mean, I still remember this. You know, you figure out really quickly how, how many hours there are in a week, 168. And uh, there were weeks where I was there for like 120 hours wow. and didn't go home. And uh, it was just the life. It was exactly what I thought it would be. <laughs> it was cool. It was adventurous. It was uh, it was it was fun. It was real fun. And that's yeah, that's why my early discography has a bunch of hip hop credits on it. And uh, because, you know, it, it, that's one thing I say to a lot of people all the time is like, you know, when you when you're running or assisting at a studio. At, at a major facility with that place had five rooms. Um, sooner or later, somebody will come in uh, and goes like, well, I booked the studio, but I don't have an engineer. Oh, my. And so now you're in the seat and, well, good luck, sir. <laughs> Can you do it? <laughs> and so that's how I got the exposure to sessions that I probably could not ever have 
landed if I just tried on my own, you know, it was just the exposure to it. You're just kind of waiting for that one day that somebody's sick. And then, yeah, if, if you put in your time, you know, the gear, you can you can be ready and prepared to jump on those sessions and, and kill it. Well, the funny part is, and, and the, I'm glad because, of course, there were, there, there's the mythical, the engineer just hit a tree on the way to the studio, which we <laughs> hope never freaking happens, please. But luckily, it was more the other thing, like, oh, we forgot to book an engineer. We didn't know that's how that works. I thought you have people here, which is true. Um, and um, then you got the gig. The, the odd part was always that maybe people don't know that. Engine, sorry, uh, studios, recording studios by themselves that are not owner run, like mine is not owner run. Yeah, I'm, I'm here, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, they don't actually hire engineers, they only have assistants on, uh, on staff. And um, sure, they're all capable, and some of them are actually killers, like they will be more capable than the person that the outside engineer that's coming in. But a lot of them have just uh, had assistants. Um, and so basically that assistant would be maybe on a salary, right? But then when the session comes in, they're like, okay, so now for this, we'll just build the label or whatever at an actual engineering rate. So he, it was kind of a great best of both worlds between you got a job, ruling job, um, and then also you have the opportunity to make some freelance money while you're at that job. It, it, it was, I think it was fair. That's, that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It was, uh, it was a fair set up for everybody it was kind of what we signed up for for better or for worse you know yeah that's very cool you'd mentioned that you guys would typically work on things like jingles and that kind of thing earlier in the day or rock records and then at night you would do the hip-hop and r&b stuff like it sounds like you were getting quite the experience of working in a lot of different styles of music and and different facets of the industry not just like the music side of it but like you know working on the 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 professional, like, you know, the jingle side of it's a different world than, than it is the music side of it. So what was your experience in doing that? Like, did you feel like you gained a lot of knowledge by doing so much variety? Or like, were you able to translate or implement certain things from the jingle side of things into the music, the music work that you were doing? Well, it's an interesting thought. I personally thought I took the gig. Well, like I had a choice. Of course, I took the gig <laughs> sure. that where you can land a jig gig. Okay, right. But like uh, one of the reasons why I actually was like, oh, I think I'm pretty lucky here because you you learned everything. Life instruments on the jingle stuff, only drum machines on the hip hop stuff. You know, uh, different mentalities of people getting stuff done really, really, really fast with super session players. Oh yeah, a bunch of jazz stuff, of course, I'm forgetting that. Life to two recordings, uh, in case people don't know what that is, it's uh, people, whatever, you have a jazz quintet in the room and you mix it to, at the time it would have been DAT or CD or whatever, um, and it's mixed and it's done and there's no multi-track and that's it, you walk home and no more mix revisions and stuff like that, which is actually a beautiful way to work because especially on records that don't, that are not planning to sell insane amounts of copies, like a, a regular jazz, jazz record does not, I mean, it's not going to be an Ariana Grande record. It doesn't matter what you try, you know, so you, uh, um, so you keep the budget wherever that was. And actually there was a rule at the time. It was spent $1 for every CD that you think you're going to sell on a jazz record. So, and you know, that basically means, you know, like you can't go much further than like 10 grand or something like that. And that includes all musicians and everybody. Right. So because otherwise you're just going to go in the hole. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was fair. So we did a bunch of those records and some of them came out really great. Um, and again, you were able to work fast with the highest calibers of musicians, you know, uh, who was there? Uh, James Carter, Marcus Miller, Lewis Nash, uh, a, a bunch, a, a bunch of like players that I basically, when I was, how oh, this is, this is what I also say a lot. Remember when I said I'm a jazz pianist? I'm like, at one point it was very clear to me that I will never be able to hang in a session with the aforementioned people I just talked about, <laughs> right? But they might hire me as a as an uh, engineer. And so and then they did. And I was like, ah, this makes a lot more sense than me trying to suck my way through some piano on this session. <laughs> you know, like, no, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> you can maybe be the tambourine guy or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, you know, like, 
I wanted to be a part. This is what what came from the musician's dream. Like I wanted to be a cat, right? Like a musical cat. And my way to be a cat was to support these musicians. And that that was kind of that was kind of always the goal: make musicians sound good, make them accept that I am an important piece of the puzzle, and they they love what I do. Do I do they always love what I do? Of course not. <laughs> We're all people, right? But like. Uh, but you know that's that's how that's where I hang my hat. That's where I'm like, I got you. But that's definitely a good goal to have is like make them sound as good as you can, and to be that extension of the group and and be that contributing partner to this whole experience and making sure that everyone is working at the best of their abilities and getting the best sound, right? Uh, I like to think so. Yeah. No. I mean, the what is the goal as an engineer is make a creative atmosphere kind of kind of be invisible but also social you know uh but it's not about you most of the time basically when when everybody when nobody says anything then you probably did pretty well and then if they give you thumbs up at the end you did exceptionally well <laughs> um yeah no i mean it, it's a, it's an interesting thing that has also changed a little bit over the years so as i learned the hang is even more important now than it was then Beforehand, and maybe that was because it was a professional facility, you were supposed to be like staff, you know, sure, like the, the regulars, like whatever the se the session musicians that play often, they would be happy to see you and become friends and all that stuff. That's good. But the actual hang that we see now in more like uh, both bedroom studios, but also like less professionally appointed recording spaces. Uh, is, is kind of a little bit different. And and I think that has something to do too with the fact that engineers themselves are really not hired much anymore. You know, um, very often there is a producer that happens to know how his gear works. Sorry, this this came out wrong. Like, of course they do know how that gear works, right? <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is like they take up the mantle of the engineer as well. And there's very seldomly sessions now where, like, you know, there's a full staff of engineers back, unless you're talking score, string sessions, big band, all that. that that's still happening, of course. But for instance, in my facility, I mix most of the time, but it can be rented as a, as a place. And every single, I, I want to say, like 98% of the times when somebody wants to rent it, they're like, I don't care what, you, what gear you have, apart from the microphone, that would be nice. Uh, and preamps, like stuff like that. We'll we're gonna bring our laptop anyway, and we're gonna run the whole show ourselves. That happens every single time, and which is fair. I'm like that. Actually, if I were that person, I would probably do the same. So, but it is a difference. It used to be we were gonna bring our head, uh, laptop, and maybe you know, at the time it was keyboards, NPCs, and all that stuff. Make sure you have all the connections, and you're gonna be the engineer, and we're gonna be making music. But now it's like everything's together in one and nobody wants to file transfer or whatever or not have their favorite plugins uh, or even presets um so it, it all makes a lot of sense but that has changed it didn't used to be that way mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely like a, a workflow based kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah I, I mean even just from my own experience like whenever you're working into a working in a new facility you're like oh what am i gonna get like you know do they have all the plugins that i have all that stuff so those questions go through your mind and then maybe sometimes you're restricted by the limitations of that studio or you know sometimes you get lucky and you get a place that has tons of great gear and that's that's always the dream right but you typically pay a lot more for those kind of places to work out of right yeah i mean in a way it's, it's funny i mean of course in in one way you're going like god oh, it's going to be a little bit complicated on the other hand if you're open to it these people know how to record true so you know like if somebody if somebody were to like just step back and go like you do your thing and i'll walk out of here with the most slamming tracks ever that's also a way to look at it you know like if it's not fear based but collaboration based then i think a lot of good can can come out of that absolutely and sometimes limitations actually create more creativity that they yeah. spark they spark more creative ideas because you just you, you experiment a little bit more and you you're hungrier to get those sounds and you figure out a way to make it happen yeah that's right that's right and then you know that combination just like when you say well i kind of wish it would sound more green and the guy puts up some preamp you've never seen and you kind of like doubt like what the heck is this and then this most awesome sound comes out of the speakers that you just couldn't have made yourself 
Isn't that the point? I mean, that's actually <laughs> the one thing. That's, that's actually one thing that I find questionable or sad a little bit where I'm like, the thing that we have so many that everybody has their home studio is, is beautiful in some regard, but in another, it's like automatically doing things ourselves that we shouldn't or, or where it would be interesting to collaborate with somebody else. And we're basically sitting in our own places that we have optimized for our creature com comfort, hopefully, but we don't expose ourselves to the fact that everybody does it a little bit different. And that's a good thing. Um, it can get lonely and that's uh, that has nothing uh, sorry that's not even a covid thing like even before covid people don't come to studios anymore everybody's like well just send me another version even the streaming stuff which i've been doing for over 10 years like streaming the mix to the client mm -hmm. for mix approval most people didn't didn't want to do it they're like just send me a new one that's okay I'm like, well, what about the collaborative act, uh, effort yeah. of this whole thing, right? That's actually one thing. It's fun, funny to me. Yes, during COVID, less people came to my actual studio. And this is a huge, beautiful studio. But more people were happy to jump on a Zoom and talk about the phone. So in a way, I saw more people during, <laughs> during pandemic than before. It was really odd. But that's interesting because you had mentioned earlier that the idea of the hang is almost more important than anything else. And with this era of like people just doing things digitally and through emails and stuff like that, I think being able to figure out how to still create that hang, it needs to be part of that process. And, and maybe it is, like you said, just hopping on a Zoom call to do your revisions or that kind of thing, rather than keeping everything so informal and in emails or something like that, you know, like by by at least being able to show your personality and have that virtual hang at the very least, you know, it still allows people to have that personal connection with their with the musicians or with the engineers. And and I think, you know, to your earlier point of being that like extension of the group, like you can't do that just by sending out words and emails, you know, like you have to have that personality and you have to be able to joke around and have fun and connect with people on a on a deeper level. And yeah, you just can't do that through email. You have to do it through like face to face contact or, you know, through Skype or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's important. Plus, sometimes email notes, for instance, are efficient, and sometimes they are efficient but opaque. Like people are writing things that they think are the right thing, and then this gets interpreted a little bit different, and that's both their fault and my fault too. And like a little like one minute phone call would have like figure would have worked much better on that. So. Uh, now I've, I actually gotten <laughs> to bridge that gap. I got gotten into people actually, you know, they're 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 talking into their text, uh, the voice memos, and I'm mm -hmm. like, that's really helpful. You're still not jumping on a phone call, which is cool, <laughs> but there's like no back and forth. But at least now I hear in your voice what you really care about, what you really mean. Sometimes they play me a little snippet, like check this out. Do you hear this thing? I just want that up. Blah blah. You know that that's 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 cool. And I'm not. I'm not nostalgic. There's also very many reasons why I prefer it this way because I can actually jump from project to project in a day. And, and on the other hand, the client can think about that and they're like, okay, so yeah, let me sit with it. I'm like, cool, take all the time I need. I actually mm -hmm. literally don't care how long it takes you because <laughs> I'll just do something different. <laughs> like I'm not waiting for you, yeah. you know? Well, if I had gone to a studio session, I would not be sitting there. So I'm like, okay, this is great things um you know so th so there's a very the ability to stretch time for as long as the client needs or compact it as long as as short as the deadline wants is is really beautiful right now you know and some some setups that used to be in the world like big ssl console with full analog uh you know uh, stuff in your in your racks is a downside now sure because you need people to handle all that you can only move slow and ssl used to be a recall of at least two hours well maybe not two but maybe like an hour to get an analog mix back unless you printed stems which at the time when i was in those kind of studios we didn't do that there were no stems nobody did that the mix was done when you left the studio and then if you wanted a recall then it cost you another twenty five hundred dollars for the studio wow they might come back or not and that's just the way it was. Nobody batted an eye at that either. But now I, I can't do that. 
<laughs> yeah, imagine telling someone twenty five hundred dollars to pull up a Pro Tool session. Like, <laughs> we never had. No, that. and even like <laughs> apart, let's forget about the money because some pl- people have that kind of money, right? But but just the inconvenience. They're like, what are you talking about? You can't have it in like an hour and a half from now. That's just uh, the world has changed. That workflow is dead to me. Like you know, there's ways around it. Like I said, there's you can have like a board mix, print stems, and then do the recalls from the Pro Tools session or whatever. And a lot of pe- people do that. Sorry, maybe not a lot anymore, but some mixes still do that. There's advantages to that. But then please also realize that come after revision one or two, that's not a board mix anymore. Not really, you know. So like, it's just a, a difference in how how to get into a digital mix. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just a totally different thing um, that, that people need to realize. There, there is no such thing anymore as, hey, I'm mixing my record on, on a board and going to tape. I mean, unless you're Jack White with his own thing, that's very unlikely. There's another guy, Vance Powell, does, does that still, I think. Mm-hmm. But very, very few people do that for every one of their projects for when that's the basis of their... Um, of their workflow because it's not fast enough. Yeah. Actually, for that matter, it also doesn't sound better. You know, like there, there used to be a time when analog ruled the world. That's true, but I have I have mixed record in digital that I like better. I've gotten I've gotten masters from people where the person's like, "Hey, I'm gonna master this all analog, and I'm gonna send you another one that's all digital, and I prefer the digital one." You know, like there's, it's it's not that it's not this magic thing that you can buy and now your your record sounds better. Most likely, it's actually going to. I mean, this is probably maybe a controversial statement. Most likely, it's going to sound worse because you can't move with the changes that the client requires as fast as you can. You can make a better first mix faster. That is true on analog, very often. Not always, but very often. But like going through the whole process and coming out the other end with the actual final product after everybody has set their piece on an analog desk, apart from being like, you know, that would be financially craziness. Um, it's just, I don't, I don't think it's true that it will be better. It might be better. Maybe sometimes. But most often I'm like, this is, this is just going to be more complicated and the client's not going to get exactly what they want. And um, there's there's a, there's a problem. I I don't think there's an advantage to analog uh, mixing in 2022. It's just a little different. Yeah, I agree with you 100. percent And I think the only people that are really successful with it are are the people that are working on analog all day every day. It's like you know, like the people who dabble in digital and like they they spend a lot of time in digital and then they occasionally go back to analog. I feel like it's one of those things. It's kind of like you start to lose the. Uh, it slows you down. You start to lose that kind of flow that you're in. And, you know, I've just noticed even with myself, like in my own music, anytime I've ever gone to a studio these days where, you know, it's like, let's do an analog mix. Those analog mixes always sound kind of crappy compared to the digital rough mix or whatever that we came up with. Just because like, you know, it's like we, we have all the tools there. The templates are there. Everything's much faster. And, you know, I don't know. That's my experience with it, at least. After at least a uh, shout, out, shout out, of course, Bob Timon, who is an, uh, mixing analog. But at least he doesn't, show, for years and years and years, he doesn't use analog uh, tape machines. He just goes from digital to digital, but he uses a desk. And as far as I know, and I, this is totally guessing, he doesn't print stems. He actually does recalls. So I'm not saying there's not nobody in the world who can do it. Of course, there mm-hmm. are some. But like in, in the grand scheme of things, how records are made, most records are now made digitally. Yeah. And that is fine. <laughs> that is <laughs> of great. Course. Whatever gets you the results, really. I guess that's, that's all that matters, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'd love to talk a little bit about your mixing process. Like when you start a mix, what is your mindset going into it? Like where do you start? How do you start? Do you always have like a specific workflow that you follow? I do. I do, actually. Um, the hardest thing in mixing, I think, at the beginning, not, not at the beginning uh, as like a layman or whatever, but on the every single day, is getting from the client what you actually need that sounds like their rough mix. That's the hardest thing. And I swear every mix that goes down south is because of a file issue. Um, because the problem is that 
people have a really hard time getting the data that they created in their studios to you in a in a complete and sensible way. Like they either they strip all their stuff off and now it sounds nothing like the right rough mix and then they want you to recreate that. Or like in the in the head they're dreaming like this is gonna be so much better than the, you get the first mix and then they're like, well basically all my notes are about needs to be more like the rough mix and I'm like thanks for not giving me <laughs> the rough mix like how I mean sorry. I I will not mix without a rough mix. You don't have a rough mix, we're not mixing. That's that's just a waste of time for everyone, um, because that that just means you're not ready. Um, but but that's that's a major hurdle. We're coming from like not. It used to be a relatively easy drop off a DA88 or or uh, or a 24 track and some session notes and you're off, right? Because nothing gets saved anyway. Sure, there would be still a rough mix that you have to match, but at least it's like implied that you kind of like rechasing stuff but now it's basically mixing has changed into a process where i'm taking what you have which is probably a pretty decent rough mix because i say this all the time producers and musicians are fantastic at blends at musical blends that's what they do that's what they do all day when they play in a band which means a rough mix should never be shitty musically speaking Everybody knows, oh, this vocal is way too loud. This guitar part is way too soft. That's not hard to fix. You just turn it up and turn it down. The trick is to get that together into the final mix and make it sound good too. I get it. But like the actual, is this too loud? Is this too soft? Anybody can do that, you know? So I actually invite producers and, and, and artists and it almost never happens, unfortunately. Like my perfect way to get ready for mixing would be to be in the, <clears throat> sorry, to save the DAW project however, wherever you are and take it down every fader and just spend five minutes putting these things back together. Come up with not necessarily a new balance, but one where you go like, okay, that makes sense. This is the reason why this thing is here. This is the reason why this thing is here. Because that's the thing that we forget in a DAW setting. We pile stuff on top of stuff. There's some kind of reason in blend in it but very seldomly do you break it down and go like but why was this here or is this this is, is this actually necessary and if you can't put like a re reasonable reasonably leveled reference together in like five ten minutes then you probably have too much stuff in there or too much stuff that's the same like for instance six paths that really are only one path you just have not printed them together you know mm -hmm. um so, so that's the thing. What we do here all day, and my assistant gets into that. She gets the files. We we have we send out a thing. Please give it to me like that. And half the people balk at us <laughs> because it's 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 quite some printing. But I'm like, if you don't do that, I can't start where you left off. That's the most important thing. I appreciate and applaud you for what you created. Why would I take all of that apart and try all over? That is a recipe for disaster. It never works. It never, ever works. Because even the people who say, yes, just do your thing, I swear, by revision two, they're like basically more like the rough mix. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so this happens all the time. So like, and then I need to put my chances to get there in a good place. When they say, well, you know, I get it, but I don't like your reverb. Can we, you know, use mine? I'm like, sure, click. Use your re reverb stem done. That's not an unreasonable request, but it is an unreasonable request if you like listen to the reference and recreate re the reverb. I'm like, I don't have time for that. Yeah, you it's already like, did it. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like how, how long? <laughs> you got to throw that back at them. Like, how long did it take you to make that rough mix? And like, that's that's going to be my starting point now. You know, <laughs> and that's fair. That's fair. But like, you know, don't withhold information from me. Thank fair. you very much. <laughs> I have absolutely zero interest recreating something that was already there. Like, I have to at least start there. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, it's already then, sounding good. Why not? Just keep yeah, <laughs> you know, and uh, and maybe you're right. Like, so again, like, the, the producer is, is a very smart person. I, I think you probably did what you thought was good. There is not an answer where, like, an engineer is always like, I have the better tools and the better knowledge, so look at me. The moment you feel that as an engineer, you're going to get fired on that gig every time. Every yeah. single time. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I don't disagree with some choices, but in the end, that's their record, not mine. So I'm like, 
if you like this piano, wooly and round and warm, and I'm using good words, but I could also say muddy, right? Hey, I will on, on, on mix one, I might tweak it my way. And on mix two, you'll get it your way because if that's important to you, sir, and if I really think that it doesn't destroy the vibe, then that's fine, bro. That's good. You know, like, let's go there. Um, that's where the collaboration goes from, uh, comes together. Like, I don't want to take a song and like, oh, now I'm doing my thing. I'm like, I don't have a thing. My thing is, I have things that I like in my head that are that I tend towards. Like, you will probably never get a muddy mix from me. I like high end. I like low end. You know, I like clarity. These are things I like in general, but that doesn't mean they're always applicable. So doing my thing is a very strange thing for me. Like, I'm like, no, let's listen to the record. And we're like, okay. And I do this all the time too. I tell people, your rough mix to me sounds like this. Musically speaking, it's all there. It's compact. Nobody could say this sucks on a musical level. I, I hear it. And actually, for, for that matter, maybe a lot of non-musical people, uh, sorry, like end users, listeners, that are not in our industry, they go like, that's a that's a great sounding song, right? Well, that's fine. That's good, right? And then I take that and I'm like, in, I, I do this to it. I blow it up. I take your idea. I take, and it kind of like fill the speakers with it and I make it, this is not just like wider or anything like that. It's not an engineering thing. It's just like kind of a feeling of like, grand, I'm blowing it up as far as I can where it fits in the vibe. But when you get it back, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Because then you're just going to go like, what the heck happened to my song? And rightfully so. So I try to stay here. And there's also not a limitation. It's just my interpretation of your rough mix will be grander, better. I'll find the engine, uh, find the energy. Will you agree with me on all of it? Of course not. This is creativity. Actually, I said this to my assistant like about a year ago. I was like, considering that we're selling creativity and not like, you know, uh, lay, lay me some tile into this floor. Um, I'm not, I'm surprised why we don't get fired like 50% of the time. Because basically we come up with stuff that's different and sometimes it's better. If you think you can improve the mix every single time and land it with the powers that be, i.e. your clients, and they all agree, it feels to me like then you can't be possibly making enough creative decisions because it's just impossible. Like you should go on an, out on a limb on a couple of things where they go like, okay, okay, okay. I see what you're doing here, but I, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. Right. So, and actually as long as everybody plays, I mean, like as long as the, the producer and the artist goes like, okay, I see what you're exploring, but we just don't like it. It doesn't fire you for it. That's a beautiful place to be, the freedom to try some things. And like, you know, in the worst case, you go back to the rough mix or, or literally the note could be, hey, that's cool, uh, closer to the rough. That's a fair note. <laughs> that, yeah, that, at least you, you tried know, what I, you had to do. Yeah, but but don't don't be mad at me that I tried. Basically, then, then you're stifling my creativity, which is really what you're paying for. Otherwise, I'm just turning stuff up and down. Because you said so. Well, you could have done that if you know it so much. Sure. Um, so I invite that kind of thing. So that's what I do. I match the rough mix with the files. That's how I start every mix. I mean, actually, my assistant does the matching. He's like, when it comes to me, basically what, what we do is we re-level it. We, we make it look like I, we, I might have engineered it, but it will sound like the rough mix as close as possible. Because I'm interested in the delta. I'm interested in taking what you have and explode it into something cooler um, or better, hopefully, um, where I can. And I want to also consistently keep what I think you did well or where we're already there. Um, that's mixing in 2022 for me, which is really funny because you sit, see here in the back as a console, it's a C24, which is it's just a controller, but still... But used, mixing used to be a bunch more about making balances and faders and movement and this and that and the other. But I think we're at a level where mixing is not about that anymore because all of that has been imprinted into the data that we already have, the DAW data. Um, so basically, like I said, I assume that you did 
a very good job at balancing it. So I touch up your balance. I don't reinvent it. You will not get a mix from me that will have a guitar that's 60 dB louder than yours. Unless I literally point it out going like, so on this one guitar, I think you really done fucked up. So here is here's where I think it should be. But in general, like I said, a musician is incapable of doing that. Do you know what I mean? Like a musician knows that it's 60 dB too soft. So why would I turn it up 60 dB? I guess I guess the only exception to that is when the musician is the one mixing. You typically find that they mix their own instrument a lot louder than everyone else generally. Yes, you're right. You're right. That can happen. But at the same time, if if those people are really, uh, if it's not ego driven, then then you'll get a, a balanced mix. I think. I, I, you're right. I, I don't know how to say this. Like like a, a reasonable musician doesn't do that do you know what i mean yeah, like, yeah i get what you're saying yeah you uh like a reasonable musician might have like the drums a db or two too hot got it totally don't worry about it but not like so loud that that this musically makes no sense guys everybody knows that right so uh, and otherwise actually if they do that if they did that little, little assumption bubble right here but if they did that then i would kind of say like how are you actually um, qualified to give me mix revisions, like if, if it's that <laughs> off, then 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 I should just go like, hey guys, uh, this rough mix sucks. You guys agree? Yeah, yeah, it sucks. In that case, we shouldn't <laughs> get any notes because I mean, what, what can you like? <laughs> I love that. So you sucked on this rough mix <laughs> so hard that now you can tell me which one what what what's better on mine or not and this is not me or my ego i'm not saying i know it right i'm just saying if you didn't notice that this was really 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 crazy bad then you basically disqualified yourself from an opinion now the problem here is of course you're still the client so that is a hurdle and a business issue but but you know what i mean so i try to expand i'm looking for the delta in my mix to yours very seldomly does somebody come to me and say, "Hey, I just don't know what to do with this song. Can you do a thing?" If, it, like I just said, I don't have a thing, but a thing. Can you do something different? I mean, if that if that that request would come in maybe once a year, like one song a year, maybe, and pro and definitely not the first song on a project. Maybe like the eighth song in an album is like, I don't, I don't know. Can you? Can you do something? But it really doesn't happen. That's not what mixing is anymore. Uh, mixing is Make make better what we have. That's Absolutely. really what everybody wants. And to get there, we have to all play together. Um, one question I did want to ask you, like w when I listen to your mixes, like one of the, the biggest things that really stands out to me is that you do such an incredible job of getting the low end right. Like you have like your mixes always sound so big and so full, but so clear. And I know that you do a lot of work in like R&B and hip hop and a lot of that stuff does require that the bass is really loud, but it doesn't feel like it's overpowering your mixes. So I'm wondering, like, what is your secret for achieving big low end? That's funny. It's going to be very, very disappointing, that answer. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. It's, it's, it's an important, important question because I think it has permeated our mixing culture that mixing low end is hard. And I don't think it is. It's actually the opposite. It's actually really easy. And let me let me say this very carefully. And it's, it's kind of step by step. Behind me, what you see are these focal speakers. But what you don't see are two subwoofers. They're in the corners, actually, where those little, underneath those little um, squares. They're tiny subwoofers. They're 12 inches, two of them. It's called the Carl, Fan, Carl Tatz Phantom Focal System. Guy in, is based in Nashville. He can tune your speakers and whatever. So basically, even though I have focal speakers, they don't really sound like focal speakers. This is tuned all the way flat to 20 hertz, right? So my my listening situation is exceptional here. So this is where we have to start. Because the problem here, people think low end is hard to mix when actually the, the question is really... This uh, low end is hard to hear correctly. And then when you then try to mix something that you can't hear correctly, you're actually making it worse. There is no way around it. 
there's no secret magic weapon of like my low end should be this and that the other if you can't hear it you can't fix it the end unfortunately that's not the that's not the answer you want to hear right now you want to have the secret right whatever but the, the problem is now imagine you have a system like mine where everything is so ruler flat that i can just hear the low end now let's say it's an 808 or, or a synth based let's forget about real bass for a moment but something that's programmed right i can literally push the fader up place it where i want it to be and i am done the reason is that i can accurately decide this is too little this is too much the end but when you actually look at low end like what low end actually is both on kicks and basses because most that's the two things that are mostly there mostly there's some uh, exceptions like for instance guitars can go down to like 80 hertz but like the the 40 50 60 70 range that's mostly kicks and bass and maybe some explosions but whatever um like now imagine you're the producer and you're actually programming this bass line. There's two things that can happen. Either you have a good bass uh, response in your room, and then when you play it or program it and you put the same velocities in your programming, it should be pretty much straight. You know, like there's no reason why it should be like this note is too high, this note is too low very few exceptions to that like the you know like synth patches are pretty balanced in that way so if you can hear it and you just put the velocity in and you just you just uh th then basically there's nothing much i can change to it sure i can give turn up the bass a little bit i turn turn up uh, or i could just turn up the eq on the bass but either way i'm like i'm not gonna get an unruly kind of thing here like it's just gonna be that now here comes the problem Let's say that same producer who's a massively awesome producer, the best in the business, whatever. Uh, but he doesn't have um, it doesn't have a, a good low end system, right? Now he can do two things. Either he goes like, "Oh, oh no, this note is too low," and he turns up the velocity. This note is too high, then turns it down. But what he really does is he's making it worse because he's basically programming it into the base response of his room which sucks which now you have a programming that sucks and sometimes you see it actually you see like eight or eights or whatever like you see like these waveforms and they're like big and then small and big and i'm like why the hell why the hell is this going up and down there's no reason for it except for i think in your room you're hearing it wrongly so you're trying to compensate and now you actually created a huge problem and this is the problem is not actually the low end. The problem is that you're programming it dynamically incorrect because you're hearing stuff in your room. So this is all stuff I would have to undo. But how would I undo that? Just with level. I just turn up the low notes and turn on down the high ones. So here comes the secret. So again, if it's well done, reasonably done and doesn't move, you have to do nothing. Just move it in place, be done. I am not kidding. I'm not lying. You can even print like six versions just with different levels of that base. But theoretically, it should be a consistent low end. If the if the um, if the part is programmed right, and if the part is not like going crazy up and down, now that's a different story, right? But like if the base does what the base should do, which is give you a tonic. Uh, sorry, not a tonic. Uh, uh, the the fundamental of the the chord somewhere there you know in most cases um so my trick for somebody that doesn't have the situation that i have listening wise would be look at your bass and maybe also your, your kick you know put it up on a vu meter which is the one up there i use the clang helm and play it back without anything on it and without actually you can solo it that's fine and if it it should be level like every single note i'm not saying like to the db though i do that sometimes um and but if it's level right what happens is even if it jumps up and down in your room listening wise you should not touch it because you know that in a decent room or in any other room, it will just play back level, which means you have control. So now if you, 
if you level the space kind of into that view range, like, you know, know, depending on the music, between three and one dB of a dynamic range, in most styles of music currently where the bass is supposed to sound full and straight and um, where every note is kind of meant to be the same, Musically speaking, I'm not saying, sure, you can have James Jamerson play into the higher registers, but at the same time, you also have to realize that there is no bass support when he plays into the high registers. So that's a different story. This is why I left left bass guitar out for a moment. But most bass parts in most regular, regular, whatever, pop, R&B, hip-hop music do not need to change from note to note. So once I actually dynamically have them right, and I'm not saying to use a compressor, but once they speak on that VU meter the same all the way through the song, then again, you're done. You might not be hearing that again, but you're, you're, doing the right, you're making the right decisions for this bass, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are some bass parts, like the one I just mentioned, where it's just not possible. Your bass will drop out if you go up by an octave. Of course. That's the musical idea of this bass line. And then if you if you hate that, then maybe you should octave, uh, like add a lower octave if it's programmed, or maybe you can use one of those uh, sub um, sub synthesizers that like Waves makes or whatever, you know, like where you can get an dr- octave from a higher part, and, like blend it in so it doesn't sound so thin. But this is this is what we perceive as big low end, I believe. It's the... Um, the always thereness the consistency. of the bottom, you know, that it that stays straight. Um, and if you really want to look at it this way, for a bass guitar, rock, rock, fender bass, whatever, you know, the application is the same. You just now have on top of that, you have a variable of the player who's either better or worse at giving you uh, a level bass, right? And that's what compressors are for. Is also what better players are for. Sorry to say it like that, you know. Um, actually, I heard this story a long time ago and that made lots of sense to me. Unfortunately, I don't know the name, but somebody said there was a bass player in Nashville, one of the session session cats, that was so great at doing exactly that. Like it was basically playing all the fundamentals so straight that even without a compressor, he would just like, you could look at the meter and it would just be ding, 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 the same level. He was just so good at it uh, that he could just produce that kind of solid low end by doing that. And um, like I said, I don't know who it was, but it made a lot of sense to me. It's like, that's very desirable. Because a compressor is always, a compressor is activating a sound on top of your source that you either like or you don't like but in my case i think these are two things wanting something level is one thing that i can do with a fader it takes a lot of time well i normally don't do it on a freaking uh, bass guitar but i do it on a repeating bass like if the hip-hop song only has four bars of a bass i'll i'll do that bit i just draw it in and then copy and paste it doesn't even take that long you know uh or the other thing is a uh, being having a compressor changing the sound and the envelope of the sound that's the different thing the hardest thing to me this is just a concept concept wise of course i understand it but it's a, it's a weird concept to me that i definitely want my source at the dynamically at the same level when and also want it influenced by the attack and release time of a compressor these two things they don't belong together in my book but when you choose a compressor you get both of these you cannot choose an LA two A and 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 want an eleven seventy six response, but yes, you get more level output. I get that, but you can get with volume automation a solid signal without any change in the actual uh, envelope of the instrument. That's very desirable to me. That's why I also don't use drum compression anymore. I use mostly the drum leveler plugin because it is. It's a thing that basically does what a compressor does without instilling the sound of a compressor on the thing. So I can now choose, oh, okay, this thing to level my notes. Cool. Then I can still use whatever uh, SSL channel strip just to get that extra punchy thing. But I'm not doing that for the, I'm not doing that for the actual leveling of the sound. 
Uh, I hope that makes sense because that's a super, for me, I'm not saying people are right or wrong, but this is how I hear it. These two things affecting sounds in different ways. Level is very fundamental and envelope is also very fundamental. But if I have control of these separately, that's magic. Yeah. That's that's amazing. I love that answer. That that was probably the most detailed best answer that we've had on this podcast about the low end. And and you're absolutely right. I think like the idea of having a listening environment where you can actually hear this stuff to begin with, like that that is crucial, you know, because otherwise I, I think where a lot of people go wrong with their mixes, especially in home studios, is that they don't have setups where they can accurately hear this hear the low end and you know, they're maybe mixing on little like three inch five inch speakers and like there's no low end in there you know so like how i think a lot of times people are just compensating to hear the low end they're they're like adding effects and processing to to hear some of that low end come up come through their speakers without realizing that like that's just not how it's supposed to sound on those speakers or in that room and you know i love what you said it's just about keeping everything very sturdy and and, uh consistent with the low end i love your your vu meter trick i think that's really important and i think it still does apply with when it comes to things like real bass guitar as well it's there's always that consistency that is super important when it comes to getting low end so yeah i love that answer it's it's, i I mean uh, maybe the only other thing that i would say to that too is the funny part is because you pointed it out this is the most of the day of mixing I actually have the the bass turned off all the way. It just, like you turn off your subwoofers? No, I turn off the bass in the in arrangement. It's okay. Mute. Uh, and the reason is, in order for me to... Okay, this is maybe how this fits together a little better. In order for me to go like the bass is unobstructed by other stuff... Um, and has space for it to shine when I finally decide, okay, it should be this loud or that loud, but it's or otherwise it's not changing that much. Um, I actually turn it off because now I can work on the rest of the arrangement and clean it up so much. And I, I, every time I use the word clean up, half the indie crowd goes like, I don't want to clean. And I'm like, that's not what I mean. You know, like um, it's almost like clean is a bad word these days. And I'm like, what I mean by clean is like, Nothing is floating around in these two speakers that shouldn't be there. So I do a lot of high pass filtering and I know half the engineers say, you shouldn't do that. And half the engineers say, I do it all the time. And I say, if it's not part of the musical event, it's gone. I don't want it. And then uh, like, actually, if you think about it in that way, and this also depends on genre. I'm not saying this is a blanket statement, but if you think of it, every part, let's say we have a chuggy, E minor guitar. Like I just said earlier, the low end on the guitar is 81 hertz on on that E. E. So physically speaking, there can be no musical energy underneath it. Could there be amp noise? Could there be some kind of thumpy part of the sound? Totally get it. But then you have to decide, is the thumpy part of the sound, is it actually a musical event or is it just an noise? So I am very, very ruthless going with low cut filters, and I'm like I cut everything out that I don't think is part of the uh, of the musical event because, for instance, let's say you have that chuggy sound, the other end of the low end is probably supported by the actual bass. So maybe now the bass plays the E an octave below, which is 40. Sorry, sorry, E uh, E on the guitar is 82 hertz. E on the bass is 41 hertz. So uh, when you play these together, all of a sudden the, the low end that that part commands or wants is actually not coming from the guitar, it's coming from the bass. But the combination of the two gives you that whole spectrum kind of feel. So now I can actually, in this particular case, I can probably filter everything under 80 hertz out of all of the guitars, every single one of them, and just leave that space open for the bass. And in combination, it sounds massive because there's nothing distracting from the frequencies in this other part. So when I turn off the bass, I listen to everything else and go like, what is in the way of the range of the bass that could possibly interfere with it? And I take it out as much as I can. And once I then put it in the bass, it just sits there like, what? 
This is where I was supposed to be. There's <laughs> nothing else here. Like there's, there is literally no other event that should be here except for, well, an explosion maybe, or like some kind of super special effect. But musically speaking, it, there's nothing there. And once you do that, you have this, this, it's almost like you have the space from like 20 hertz. Sorry, that's not really important knowledge, but it's, it's there. From 20 hertz to like, say, 80 and there's nothing left there, just the bass and the bottom of the kick drum. And all of a sudden it's clean and wide and open and because nothing is in the way. It's, it's almost the funny part is you say, that, that's why I said at the beginning, it's going to be a little, the answer is disappointing because duh, of course, if there's not there, nothing there, it doesn't <laughs> have to compete with anything. So that was easy. Thanks, Richard. I mean, but it is the truth. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you know that, that that it is it is just the truth. It's I can't. It's it's funny how many times I get questions of like, hey, can you tell me how did you mix this or that, like this sound? Where I'm like, most of the time the answer is I turned that up and I sort of turned the stuff down that sucked, and that was kind of it. Like there is none. <laughs> I wish there was more. I said I said this on Facebook the other day. It meant if. If musicians' tips were like mixing tips, right? Then we would read shit like this. Hey guys, this is the C major scale, C D E F G A B C. But there's a secret. If you really want to do it like a pro, you would play it C D E. Then you'd like take the F flat, and you push the G a little sharp, and that's how hit records sound. And then you play A B C. <laughs> that is literally what people are doing to mixing tricks. <laughs> And I'm like, no, you just turn the shit up or you turn the shit down. <laughs> Love then, it. And then it's better. I mean, there's no real secret there. No, does that not mean that I don't listen to mixes and go like, how the hell did the guy do that? Of course I have that. But I do know the answer to it too. Like, yeah, he leveled it better and he had a great, uh, a great monitoring and also uh, maybe the 30 years of experience help. But there is no, there is no trick, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you haven't practiced enough. Oh, I'm sorry to say so, but that's the same thing. Why we, you know, you buy the PRS guitar and then you want the Les Paul, whatever. You, none of them is better or makes you a better guitar player, but it just sounds a little different. There's no secret. It just sounds a little different. Yeah, um, <laughs> it's sad, but it's the truth. Unfortunately, and just like I am, hopefully better at than many people. I also look at other people and go like, shit, that guy is incredible. I don't know how he does it. What is your secret? <laughs> and the answer would be similarly um, similarly disappointing to me. I'm like, but I do the same, but your sounds, oh, come on. Man. <laughs> but it's the truth. Unfortunately, there will never be there will never be an outcome that's different. You can listen to these podcasts and tips for 20 more years. And if uh, trust me, the secrets are out there in spades because yeah. the secret is just the truth. You know, yeah. like uh, you find enough services that literally have the truth. This is how records are made. There's no, and so, like, there's nothing we're waiting for. Like, I hope so and so will tell me how this works because it's already out there. Yeah, absolutely. So then, so then, with that said, another element of your mixes that also really stands out to me is the way you handle your vocal processing. And is it a similar thing where you're just really aiming for that consistency with the the vocal levels like you would with the bass? Is, is that part of your process there? Uh, no, no. Um, I do I do tend to like to hear vocals. I, I tend to like them in a way, a way where I hear every word, et cetera, et cetera. But I also do not like audible compression on vocals. And when I say that, of course, you will hear the compression on, on many vocals I do, but uh, I don't, I have a problem with like, you know, setting, sending, sending a vocal track through a compressor for the length of the song kind of never works for me because it, it has musical, there are musical differences that I like to work on between verses, speakers, choruses, bridges. So I actually, I split vocals into probably, I mean, my assistant sees it a minimum five but probably 10 tracks always because you can optimize a section because the the, the thing is a vocal compressor fights against different arrangements in any part of the arrangement again some people that disagree with me on that hardcore 
but, uh, and uh, they are not wrong. I'm just, I just hear it this way. That I was like, you know, I want to see in this verse, we have an acoustic guitar and some drum pattern and whatever. And so I don't need as much compression, but uh, to even give you the idea of a vocal that is straight in your face and, and, and even. But then, for instance, the chorus comes along, and there's six guitars. And I'm like, well, now the compression has to be stronger, which will not even sound all that much stronger, but it took that much in order to fight against the other parts of the arrangements. I can't get away with the same setting that, or maybe some people can, but I can't. Where like, I think there's many downsides to, to that approach, so I do it differently. Um, so basically, I compress an EQ by section. There's an overall EQ. Sure, like when this this vocal is a little dark, this vocal needs more bite. Sure, I do that on on like an aux or whatever, so the whole vocal goes through that. Or in a revision, when when the client says, "Well, that's good, but I want more bottom." Cool, you get that. But but in between, I I I, it's kind of silly to me, like when you have like whatever a hundred track arrangements and everything is on the same on their same uh, sorry on their own track and then the vocal is one fader i'm like that doesn't make sense to me at all <laughs> actually it should be the opposite everything that you already like the blender should be one stereo file my vocal should be mini files um that's how i look at music in that kind of way and sometimes you copy the setting and it's still fine you know but uh, it's a handleability there too where you go like okay so but the chorus can come up i don't even automate the chorus i, I mean sorry i do but I don't need to because I just set it at a different level. You know, like the less automation I can do on the faders, even though I love it, don't get me wrong, I love automation in general, but the less I can do while I'm building the mix, the faster it's going to go. So if I already know the verse has to be louder than the chorus, which is something that happens all the time, verse vocals are very loud and chorus vocals are actually very soft speaking the, most of the time because they're just, they're most of the time they're in a higher register, then with more energy. That's what choruses are for. Not not always, you know, but you know what I mean. But actually, the actual level that it plays back when is most of the time is lower. It's a it's very it's an, a very unmusical thing in general. Something that you have to think about. But if you listen to it very often, verse one, first vocal comes in, that's the loudest part of the of the song, the vocal part. It sounds big. It's a, now the vocal in a compressor, now the chorus hits in a compressed song, like some kind of rock, pop, R&B thing. The, compre- the, the, the whole chorus is just bigger, but the actual vocal inside of it is actually smaller than what happened in the verse. It happens all the time. And you just have to kind of, suspend your disbelief like a musician would go like that's freaking weird why would the verse vocal be louder than the chorus and the reason the the reason is i think this is something that actually the sae taught me and i thought it was always a smart thing if you record a piano and the guy is playing soft right uh and you record and then he play hammers the piano really loud and you record the same thing but then you play them back you play the loud part soft and the soft part loud, you still know which one was the soft piano because the instrument, (coughs) sorry, because the instrument shows you that you hammered it. Like the the overtones that are created, the sound that we associate with that uh, piano is loud, not the fact that we played it loud, back loud or soft. And that's the same thing that happen, I think happens with the verses. The verses are uncom- un- mostly uncompressed vocals forward. It has nothing to go against. But then in the chorus, the vocal is not the loudest. It is actually piercing through in a different way. But there's so much more going on around it that it actually sounds softer than the verse. Um, it's very an un- unmusical thought. But if you look at contemporary music that's kind of what happens in that's true in most songs a very the first time i really noticed it the, like when i was like okay i need to learn how to mix it blah, blah. the first time i really 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 noticed it was uh aerosmith um living on a pr- not living on a prayer that's uh, uh there's something wrong in the world today living on the edge right 
So if you listen to that again, that's exactly what it is. The vo- verse vocal is really loud. And then the ver- the chorus comes in and you're like, wait, that vocal is like 3 dB too soft. Actually, it's not that. It works really well, but it is much lower than the verse vocal. And that, and now if you hear it like on a Jonas Brothers song or whatever, it's just, it, that's just how records are made with this much compression. Yeah, it makes sense that there's a lot more competing for that same space in the choruses because everyone everyone wants their chorus to be loud and bumping and have lots of instrumentation and all that kind of stuff so yeah it definitely creates less less clarity for the vocal to like really pop pop through yeah yeah yep, that makes and sense. so and otherwise i mean as far as effects goes i i'm pretty i'm surprisingly um they have a wheelhouse of things like shorter longer whatever reverbs and some delays that i use but for specific things like it's, it's almost like i'm having a harder time making an actual vocal sound that's odd or weird unless obviously it's already there in the, the whatever the uh, rough mix has done i use reverbs and delays in more musical ways i'm like so let's say somebody wants a delay do they actually want a delay like the sound of the delay is that why they choose it or the, do they want it to to subtly enhance the the performance, the rhythm performance? And I'm I'm most often I'm in the second category. I'm like, hey, apart from the fa- fact that the delay is really cool, like what does this actually musically do? And if, for instance, if I choose an eighth note delay on a vocal that has that has most of the phrases land on uh, on full notes, sorry, not full notes, on quarters. Like if you do like da, a vocal melody line that goes like la 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 something like that, right? Yeah. If I put an eighth note delay, delay on it, it would sound like da 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 da, right? If I put a quarter note on it, it would go like da 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 da, right? So like if 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 I see that the vocal has a musical subdivision that works. Sorry, not the subdivision, a, a musical pattern that is most often that. Of course, the vocal will change from time to time. Then I can, in this particular case, I could, I could emphasize the offbeat with the eighth note delay. Now, if if the vocal already does is on the offbeat, where you go like one, two, three, four, da, 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 da. If I put an eighth note in on it, it would happen one, two, three, four, da, 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 which actually would give me less of a bounce, right? So actually, I listen to the vocal in that way. It's like if it's more on the straights on the of of the rhythm. I add eighth notes or sixteenth notes that give me that subtle bounce that add a bounce to the music. And actually, if it's on the other ones, I would probably start by choosing a, a quarter note delay because now what's on the offbeat will the delay will also land on the offbeat, which again uh, emphasizes the bounce. So instead of choosing the sound of like delay is cool, bro, I am deciding <laughs> like what what musically is is it lengthening down the track. Or is it like sprightening it up? And which which feeling do I want? Because yeah. both obviously are applicable in specific cases. But I, I love that. And that makes a lot of sense. Because I, I do think that a lot of people just default to the, like you said, like reverb's cool, bro, or delay's cool, bro. And it's just like you throw it on everything. And you're the, the half the time people aren't even thinking about the context of what's really going on. It's just like they add these effects in it. And then they realize, like, then they're like, oh, shit, why does my vocal sound very clear? And it's like, well, because the effects you threw on are fighting the 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 rhythms and the the clarity of of what's being sung so so that makes a lot of sense i do notice that a lot of your vocals you don't tend to use like really washy reverbs like most people tend to gravitate towards it sounds like you tend to go a little more towards the delay side of things and you know kind of just fit something in that is just subtly there but the vocal is like you know it's not being drowned out by all these washy tones it's just like you tuck reverb under or you tuck some delay underneath and it it makes the vocal feel a little bit more deep it's got a little bit more depth and ambience to it but the vocal is still in the forefront of the mix and and i think with your explanation of how you use delays it, it makes sense that like you feel the delay it's not taking over the sound though of the vocal yeah it's, it's true and actually the, thanks for noticing that it's it, remember to our, our base conversation i spent insane amount of time i think checking on vocals and background vocals there's nothing floats around the space that's not needed um 
So there's a lot of EQing on the reverb going on. Because once a reverb is a sound that's generated by another sound, but in the end, it's just a sound. It could have been a stem. It could have been whatever. So the fact that this there should mean I can affect it and I should affect it just like any other sound, you know? So there's a lot of low cutting, a lot of low mid cutting going on. So just so you go like, well, and you still need to hear the reverb, but if it's, if it's there, it shouldn't clash with the guitar and all that stuff. Um, so just as much as I turn off other things uh, in the mix, I basically I turn off things. Let me say that a little bit differently. The way I do it is like I, I choose a sound. I choose a blanket of a canvas of what, what the vocal could or should sound like. And that might change during the mix, but like I start with that. And I have some favorites, of course. Mostly plates, plate reverbs, less hall reverbs. So they seem to be like a little bit more splashy and, and stuff like that. And um, sorry, when an, when I'm getting into a point where I'm like, okay, so I think now it's time to clean up the sound space a little bit. I go into headphones and I start with, okay, turn on all the drums, nothing else. Okay, sounds there's no crud, no weirdness. It sounds clear or like intended and nothing is flowing around. Good. At one layer at the time, guitars, bass. Well, like I said, bass I do normally last, but when I check it, like I turn stuff on. And at one point during that process, something will go like, oh, okay, there's the problem. That's the thing. Everything beforehand sounded clean and wherever it should be. Now the last layer I turn on just blanketed it. And then you have to go through every single one. Which one is blanketing? Why is it doing that? And then you 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 sacrifice. You sacrifice a sound. You're like, okay, so musically speaking, I still have to have this here, but frequency speaking, I don't. So I might do something that I call inverse EQ. Uh, it's not my concept either, but I like it. Where um, instead of, for instance, taking out all, all the mud out of an acoustic guitar, I might do the opposite where I say, I'm going to boost only what I th need of this guitar and by insane amounts, like 15 dB of mid range, something might, right? Yeah. And um, then I duck. Then now that sticks out by like 7 dB. That's bad, right? But now I can actually lower the guitar back into the mix because I still hear the part that's actually good about it. And everything else actually gets lower and it's out of the way now. So maybe it might be the pick sound. I mean, sure, you still need to hear the chords, whatever. But in a dense arrangement, there is a part of the of the music, sorry, of the uh of the instrument's range, that is the one, that's the kind of the reason why you recorded it, why you were missing something. But the detail of everything else, the bum, the thickness of the guitar might not matter. Maybe it's the chorus with 12 guitars and that you just don't, you will never hear it except for it's mud, right? But then you can obviously duplicate the track or automate it that in the chorus, sorry, in the verse when it's more open, now it gets full range again. We always have to, there is no such thing in my, my um in my book a sound that works in the entire in the entire arrangement for instance pianos i eq them by a section i level them by a section i don't normally don't compress them i just because normally you hear something like little playing and then banging in the chorus that i i split them up into three or four because in every section it's to me it's a different instrument it just happens to be played on the same instrument um, and this all comes from a more manufactured sound these days. It's just, you got to realize that that we are in a world where sound is more crafted, both with auto-tune, but also reverb and compressors and EQ moves and all that stuff. And so I feel that nothing can just be like, here's the sound and then this will work. This, this might work if you're lucky, but not always. It's the more The more dynamic it is, the more work it might need. That's mostly strings. Sorry, that's actually most of the time. I think the most the most dynamic things in the mix are vocal, bass if it's live, and uh, piano. Maybe strings too, like live strings. But those live strings, actually, for that matter, most of the time they work pretty well when they're actually left alone. Like when the dynamic work in in the music the way it's recorded that that works pretty well most of the time but everything else that's dynamic most of the time needs a lot of work and then stuff that's 
compressed or compressed by definition, like a guitar, an electric guitar chord is compressed by its definition, by the way that it hits the amplifier or whatever. So that part might not need compression because it's already compressed because it just sits there. Um, but everything that's dynamic needs work. And like some people choose to do that with compressors and some are really fantastically awesome at that. Some people are like, really? That, that's, I mean, it's a hit song, but really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that happens to me all the time. You know, yeah. listen, and I'm not going to say any names right now, but I'm like, really? Everybody thought this was great. I mean, yes, it is the biggest song ever made this year, but like, that doesn't sound that great. Uh, shit. You know, and I'm not saying I'm making only hit records or I'm not saying I'm making only great sounding records, but I have opinions about records. Mine too. <laughs> like I'm like, ah, this, this one I did better. Yeah. This one like, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I love that idea. Like, I mean, basically what you're saying is that like, you just have to, everything has to be serving a purpose and you have to be very intentional about the, uh, you have to be very intentional about the arrangement of your song and the elements you put into your song. And by being aware of that stuff, it then can inform your mix decisions so that you can, you know, like you said, be extreme with the guitar in that one spot because that's the sound that you wanted. That's the that's the intention of that guitar in that section. So you can, you know, shape it to whatever you need to fit it in the mix and, and it's meant to sound that way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that like, you know, so many people just especially in digital, we throw so much stuff into our mixes because we we can and people don't really give it the time of day to think like what what am i really actually trying to achieve with this instrument what is, what role is it playing in the context of of the mix here um, yeah, so yeah why is it there somebody missed something at that point that's why it's there that's that's sorry that's the purest answer because on on also on artist and producer side sometimes they just put too much stuff in and i'm not saying they're wrong i'm just saying arguably speaking if I asked you, why you put that in? And they're like, uh, sound cool. Yeah. Cool. That's actually not even the wrong answer. But like, does it do anything? If I turn it off, do you think it's better or worse? And at the same time, I need you to agree. I don't need you to agree with me. You can also still just say, well, it doesn't really do anything, but it sounds cool. And that's yeah. all. Yeah, you're done. I don't need. <laughs> I don't need you tell you you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, but but I I think everybody should try this. Like, do a wall of guitar and add one more guitar now with something else, and then just make it. Then work with the EQ and figure out which part of this extra guitar shines through this wall of guitar without me just turning it up. And I think you will find a world of space. Because then what what happens too is like all the stuff that you're losing, for instance, the bottom might be gone now, or maybe in the high end, depending on what you and how you EQ it, right? That is filled in psychoacoustically by the other parts that are there. So in the end, even though it's all playing, you actually don't even feel like, oh shit, this this sound is really fucking weird and um mid-rangey and just pokey in that one section, because your brain fills in the other frequencies from other places, and you're like, oh, that sounds like a totally fat guitar um overall but in the in the mix you lo you won like eight 10 db of mud reduction or and uh, or or it could be high end reduction too like whatever is in the way you know that's i think how you get a blend that that is that optimizes the space for everyone that makes and sense it goes exactly with the statement that i say about arrangements like the less the less stuff you have in your mix the bigger it will sound the end I, nobody can con consider uh, convince me of of a different thing if you have two guitars drums and bass and it's properly mixed and well played it will probably sound bigger than your 16 guitar new new metal thing you just put together uh it, they sound different i mean i'm not saying there's no cool thing about having 16 guitars but it's not size it's really not size mm -hmm. this was actually something that's really cool about i think it was audio slayer's first album um and i i could my, i could have my facts wrong i know rich costi mixed that um i'm pretty sure yeah but what i heard and i, I could be wrong but it, it seems to me like it, the guitar the main guitarists were not even doubled but they were doubled uh, electronically so it's like actually one guitar part um with like some kind of pitch shifter or whatever on both sides 
Again, I could be wrong, but that's what it heard to, uh, sounded like to me. And that stuff sounds just massive because these two parts, I mean, the same part even, but like come out of two speakers, are now like filling this whole spectrum with one part. And it's just like, what was the, the record? Like a stone? I guess that's the yeah, one. Yeah, that was, that was a big one from that. Yeah, You should listen to that. It's, it's pretty amazing how little stuff is in there and how big it sounds. Um, and so actually, in a way, by, by making a guitar part smaller with EQ, like I just described, it makes the record bigger because less space is used. So there's more space being uh, used by the vocal or the guitars or what have you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, or drums or like other parts. And together it will sound bigger. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, that's my and, statement, and I stand by it. <laughs> and, and it makes a lot of sense. And nobody's listening to these tracks in solo to even notice that there's that much gain or EQ or whatever on these tracks. So, yeah, that's that's a really great point. Uh, yeah, Richard, I, we, we've gone on long here, and I, I certainly don't want to take up more of your day. Uh, this has been amazing. I, you have a very methodical process. In a, I can tell you, you think deeply about the work that you do, and it absolutely shows in the, in the work that you do as well. So uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Of course. No, thank you for having me. This is super fun. I, I, I love talking about this stuff at all times. So that was my interview with Richard Furch. And that was amazing. I just like I, every bit of that conversation I was loving. Like he just has such a methodical way of of thinking through his process and approaching his decisions when it comes to his mixes. And I love everything that he said there about mixing low end and making sure that everything sounds super consistent. And I also thought it was really interesting to hear how he approached his vocal effects, especially when it came to things like delays. And again, it's just like listening to the way he describes his process. It's very methodical. Everything has purpose. And the whole process that he goes through is very well thought out. It's not just a matter of slapping on an effect because that's what everyone else does. Instead, he's very purposeful with when he uses a delay and how he uses the delay or how he uses a reverb and how it's going to affect the clarity of the overall mix. So this is definitely something that I think you should go back and listen to again because it's such an important point. And if you're struggling to get clarity in your mixes, especially with your vocals, chances are good that you might not be thinking through your, your mix moves very well. You might just be doing things out of habit, but when you listen to Richard's approach, it'll start to click a little bit more about how you can be intentional about what you're doing with your mixes and why you're doing it. So yeah, I just love that interview. Richard, thank you so much for being on the podcast. That was amazing. Definitely have to have you come back at some point. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the podcast. That way you're notified about all new episodes as they go live each and every Wednesday. And also make sure to visit MasterYourMix.com. That is where I help out musicians with creating pro sounding mixes from their home studios. And on the website, we've got tons of great resources designed to help make the process of mixing your music super easy and super straightforward. And one resource that you're definitely going to want to check out is called The Mixing Mindset. This is a book that I put out a few years ago where I walk you through the entire process from beginning to end of mixing your tracks and walk you through the process of knowing knowing what to analyze, what to pay attention to, when to be boosting, when to be cutting, when to use effects, when to use automation, all of this stuff so that you can be making mixes that sound clear and polished and you have a clear focus throughout the whole process rather than a scatterbrained approach. This is going to walk you through beginning to end how to make decisions that are going to get you the results that you hear in your head. So definitely make sure to check that out. It's called The Mixing Mindset and it's available at MasterYourMix.com. So that is it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I can't wait to talk to you in the next one. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Master Your Mix podcast. To have your questions answered, submit your questions to questions at masteryourmix.com. Please go to iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And for more information on how you can improve your mixes, visit masteryourmix.com.